All right. Well, welcome to another episode of Chewing the Cud. This is a weekly live stream where we sit down on Sunday evenings at the kitchen table and discuss things related and unrelated to regenerative agriculture. Um, we usually start off with some brief introductions for those who don't know who we are and what we're all about. Um, and then we'll move into the topic for the week. Uh, this week's topic is um, fencing philosophy. So um, just sort of the overview about all, you know, your permanent, your interior fences, your temporary wires, like all that kind of stuff. Um, sort of the philosophy behind how we use them and, and, and things to think about. Um, and we can get into nitty gritty about that kind of stuff, about specifics of like tips and tricks and techniques and gear and that kind of stuff if you guys want to do that. Um, and then we'll open it up to a question answer, ask us anything type deal. Um, which is the part that we really enjoy. So, um, yeah, I guess we'll start with some, some introductions for those who are, yep. this is your first live stream. Yeah. So welcome. Or if you're my, watching on YouTube. So. Welcome. My name is Isaac Tappenden. Um, I'm an intern here. Ben is Ben Holly is the other intern. Um, we are interning under Greg Judy, who is the, him and his wife own Green Pastures Farm. We run around 370 head of South Pole cattle. Roughly 160 St. Croix sired hair sheep. We sell guardian dogs, bale and rollers. We give farm tours. We host grazing schools. And Ben and I are here just to learn the ropes and and uh, you know gain valuable experience for our future future endeavors. So with that, absolutely, we're, yeah, that kind of wraps it up as far as what we're doing here. Yep. Um, um, okay, so we'll get into the topic for today, which is which is fence. Um, and I guess like the, the most logical place in my mind to start with is is perimeter fencing and, and permanent permanent perimeter fence, which is a must have. Like last week we talked about water and you that's sort of the order you wanna be looking at things. Like obviously you need perimeter fence to keep your animals in your farm and not roaming all over creation. Um, that's super important. It also makes you sleep better at night knowing that your animals are going to be in regardless if they bust down an interior wire or they get into trouble or whatever, they're going to stay on the farm. And that's, that's super critical. But once you figure out your water situation, really the next thing you got to lay out is your fencing, your fencing diagram, if you will, for your property. Um, and so for perimeter fence, um, it, it serves two functions really like the primary function obviously is keeping your animals in um and then in in our in our sort of line of work i guess we we use the perimeter fence as a way to transfer or i guess transmit electricity across the farm to make um to be able to make our interior wires hot or pretty much anything we want to electrify we can use uh, we can use the perimeter fence as the hookup for all the interior stuff and then all the stuff coming off of the interior stuff. Um, so yeah, I mean, in a nutshell, that's really what you're using your perimeter for. Um, and, and I mean, we were, we're huge proponents of high tensile, um, high tensile electrified perimeter fences. Um, that's what, that's our go-to. Um, 180,000 PSI is 112 and a half gauge, 12 and a half gauge. Um, and, and there's, there's, a, there's, I mean, if we want to get into specifics, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's, there's like several companies that, that you'd want to buy them, buy it from. You wouldn't necessarily want to go to your local farm and home store and pick up some high tensile wire because it, it, in all likelihood, it'll be complete junk. Um, that's something that Greg has stressed to us. So, um, I think like brands, brands are like, you know, true test. Um, what is it? Get, uh, power, uh, power flex, flex maybe. I can grab my computer. I have a whole spreadsheet. Um, was it? Yeah. But, um, yeah, let me, let me do that. Why don't you, why don't you talk about, why don't you talk about something related to interior fences fence or, or perimeter, perimeter, fence, perimeter yeah. fence? So yeah, obviously with the perimeter fence, so it really the object is to keep the animals in. Um, you, you can go the route of barbed wire or woven wire as more of a physical fence. Um, that's not the direction Greg's chosen to go for a multitude of reasons. Um, yeah, we, we use the, the, the electric fence is a, is a psychological barrier as opposed to a physical barrier. Yep. And so if you can, if you can get inside that animal's mind, you have a lot more control than just using, you know, 
posts and, and wire um, to rely on keeping them in as far as like physically. Um, yeah. Yeah. So back to, sorry. So back to the, um, the high tensile, the high tensile. So it's, it's like true test Gallagher power flex and Ken Cove are all brands that you could probably, that you would trust as, as being a high quality, high tensile wire. Um, and that stuff does, I mean, it lasts forever. Like it does not, it doesn't, the good quality stuff doesn't rust or corrode and, mm -hmm. um, and, and it'll last for, I mean, he's, Greg's got stuff up that's like 20 years old. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it, I mean, there's no signs of corrosion on it for the most part. The only spots where sometimes we get on like perimeter stuff where sometimes we'll get problems is if you have like a, like a gate hookup or something like that, and it'll eventually like burn a hole in the wire if it keeps shorting. Shorting and stuff, um, yeah. But that takes a while for that to happen. The other huge advantage of using um, high tensile as a perimeter as opposed to barbed wire or woven wire mm -hmm. is when you have a when you have a giant tree that falls on your fence, um, it, literally all you have to do is just walk over to it, cut, I mean, obviously turn the power off on your fence, walk over to it, cut off the, the section of, of tree or, or branch or whatever that's on your fence and the fence will just spring right back into place. As long as the wires haven't been kinked and snapped, they'll like they don't break there's the wires are really flexible really flexible it's almost, part of that's because of the posts that we use too yeah so what we can also talk about that yeah so greg's a huge proponent of uh non-conductive posts whether that be fiberglass um timeless fence makes a really good line post yep um yeah those are those are the two big ones fiberglass there, and timeless there's people people have used like you can always use wood. You That's can use it. wood with insulators. Yep. And you kind of you kind of want to stay away from uh, steel posts with insulators just because if you think about it, you've got whatever, 200 ground rods sitting there with your wire attached to it. Yep. So it's just a problem waiting to happen. I mean, so. a deer walks into it and then yeah. all of a sudden your fence is shorting out like crazy and you have no power and then your cattle get out and mm -hmm. i mean it's just an absolute nightmare even if you're even if you have wood with insulators on it like if if something knocks that off the wood is nowhere near as conductive as as a steel post and so it's not going to completely ground your fence out it'll short out a little bit but yeah. um it's it's not something where it's going to be like arcing like crazy and just bringing bring your power, power down to zero two thousand volts um, whatever. so so yeah, so the, the, the combination of either the fiberglass or the timeless posts as well as um and as well as you know the high tensile wire makes an extremely durable fence. If anything falls in it or runs into it or whatever, it's really difficult to break. The only time when the high tensile stuff breaks is if if you're like setting it up or you have it loose and you get a kink in it and then you pull it tight, mm -hmm. it can break that way. But as long as, as long as you don't have a kink in your wire, it's gonna, I mean, it's just incredibly strong. 180,000 PSI. By kink, he means like, so say you're pulling a wire and you get let go loose and it like backwards coils up, Yep. if that makes sense. So like it goes like this and then it like hooks like that, then it's gonna kink when you pull it tight and so that's when it's going to break like when you know like if you're using your garden hose and you're like trying to wash something and then all of a sudden there's no water coming out of the hose and you can look back and there's a big big kink in it it's the exact same deal except what happens when you get it that like that and you pull it is it'll snap mm -hmm. um which is also like a little trick if you don't have a pair of pliers yep. and you need to cut a piece of high tensile wire if you, if you bend it one way and then bend it back the other way, it's going to snap. Yeah. So you like intentionally will kink it and, and it, you can just bend it and bend it. And then sometimes you have to do it maybe another time and it'll just snap, snap right off. Um, which is pretty cool because like it's, it's so tough that if you use a normal pair of pliers to try to cut it like wire cutters, you'll put a big gouge in your wire cutters. If you, if you start cutting any sort of volume of high tensile wire with just normal, normal cutters, you need, you need, we, we, we use Nipex. We love Nipex insulated wire cutters, it's pliers. A, I think it's a German company. Um, or German, maybe not. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, I think I think you're right. Yeah, but the the insulated pliers are super helpful because in a pinch, if you need to like cut something, you don't have to run all the way back to a switch or find a way to turn the the fence off. You can just like grab a piece of wire or cut it or something and not have to worry about getting shocked. Mm -hmm. um, 
but the steel in there, doesn't, this doesn't work. If there's a if there's a hole in the handle, if there's any kind of moisture <laughs> and there's a little crack in the handle, oh. it'll get you. And oh. that's that's from past experience. But um, but the steel is like hardened. It's like a, it's like hardened hardened steel, hardened yeah. steel like cutters, and so it won't put a, put a big gouge in your cutting surface from from you know having like cutting the high tensile wire. It's that strong, um, and it's that's the reason why we use twelve and a half gauge as opposed to like nine gauge. Um, is because nine gauge is just crazy thick in comparison. And you can't hardly do anything with it. Like it's hard to work with. Yeah. Like if you're trying to put crimps in or you're trying to do a hangman's knot, it's just so tough to work with. Cause it won't, there's like no bend, like no bend in it at all. But if um, you go any less than, tw or 12 less as in higher. higher. So like higher gauge is thinner wire. Like 18 gauge is like piano wire. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to go thinner no. than that because then it's just brittle. Thinner than 12 and a half. Yeah, gauge. thinner than 12 and a half. So higher than 12 and a half gauge that's sort of the sweet spot the goldilocks fence is is 12 and a half gauge yeah. from greg's experience we've got we've got a, a perimeter fence on one of the farms that's nine gauge and it's and, a good fence and yeah it's strong but it's, it's just it's hard to crazy work. conductive it's just hard to work yeah it is yeah it's a lot more conductive yeah. you gotta think about it like this it's the same way with water greg yeah. was describing yeah. it it's like the bigger the pipe or flow you of know like the nine gauge is bigger it can it can push more so it's like more juice that you get from it and so yep. yeah but 12 and a half gauge is the way to go um so so that's sort of like perimeter fence it's pretty simple like there's not a lot to it um there's a lot of technique involved in like making it easy on yourself when you're setting it up and that's kind of hard to describe without actively being able to see yeah, it so we're not going to get into that um but the sort of the second piece once you have your perimeter set up is um once you have your you, once you have your perimeter set up, this the next piece to the puzzle is to understand where and when you should be putting interior permanent fencing. So that'd be like paddock divisions or um, around ponds or like exclusion areas or like things like that. Um, or uh, it, it would be would would be useful to put in um, permanent. But the overall philosophy that Greg has and and we we agree with it a hundred percent. From, from working in this sort of using this stuff all the time is that if you have like a new area that you're going to, whether it's a new lease, a new piece of property or whatever, um, I would highly suggest to invest in more temporary, like as in step in posts and poly braid and stuff like that. So you can do everything in temporary in the beginning and then understand what your traffic patterns are like, what wires you're constantly putting up over and over and over again, regardless of how you're fencing it. Um, and it just gives you a much better idea of like, this is where I need an interior wire. This is where this is where I don't need to put an interior wire because sometimes we don't like to make the paddock that size. Um, the more flexibility you can give yourself on the in interior of your farm, the uh, it's gonna just gonna be way more effective grazing um, system uh, if you can do that. So. That's something definitely to keep in mind. The worst thing is a poorly put fence. Like if you have a fence in the wrong place, it becomes a huge burden to like your grazing plant. Yep, yeah. and it's 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 effort to put it up and it's effort to take it out. And so if you can just wait, if you've got enough temporary stuff and just operate with almost all temporary and then once you've gone through it a couple times and you sort of understand how you want to graze the piece of land, cause you, you can have an idea of how you want to do something. And then it, it doesn't really click until you get animals on there and you see how they're moving around and, and like, they're, they're going to show you things that you didn't really think about. Like areas where you're like, man, I got to keep them out of that. Or I really need to sort of fence it. So it's not pinched over here. I need to get like, a, like a wider area over here so that they can get more grazing in that, that spot. Like, if, if you got, you know, all sorts of permanent interior fencing all over the place, you just, you just made yourself a lot of extra work. Um, so keep it as simple and open as you can on the inside. And obviously starting out, it was starting out. Obviously there's things that you can tell right off the bat are going to be problematic and you need to fence off permanently. Like, I don't know if you want to keep them out of a pond and you've got a, a tire tank below it, that that's always a good situation. And um, you've got a wood section that you Yep. You, kinda, you don't want cattle getting into or yep. you've got an exclusion zone like above a pond. Um, but sometimes those are a little bit hard to see unless the cattle are in there. Um, if you've got water lines, especially surface water, like like um, 
hoses. Like ho like serve like you know if you have a HDP line above ground, you're it's it's always a good idea to like run a, a, a permanent wire over the top of that so the cattle aren't actually gonna step on it. Um, if it's under the ground, then obviously you don't have to worry about it. it gives you a lot more flexibility. Um, but yeah, just try to keep it as simple as you can in the beginning, and then add in layers as you go on to make it efficient. And I mean, the less fence you have to put up, like the more cost effective it's going to be. You know what I mean? You don't have to spend all that money on posts and material and um, labor and like all that kind of stuff and yeah. maintenance as well. You know, like there is maintenance involved with the fence. It's not like you you, you just set it up and, and leave it because it's electrified. And, and a big amount of the maintenance is making sure you don't have a lot of brush pressure or like brush clearing. Yeah. And the fence will do a lot of that for you as far as like if, if you leave the fence on. That's, fence an, that's, that's an important point actually. Yeah. So Greg, in, in all the farms, all the chargers are left on 24-7, 365. Yep. And what that does, especially in the growing season, is it's constantly sending that pulse through the wire. And so any kind of little grass blade or... or uh, little tree branch or something that's growing up and touching that wire is getting shocked and shocked again. And that's, it's going through the sap and it's killing that sap flow. So it, it's sent like over time, it keeps the brush and the, and the grass and the vegetative load off the fence. Whereas if you turn your fencers off, you know, when you leave the farm with the cattle and you come back, do your rotation, you get back around that, that fence line has had whatever, 60 days, to grow up on your fence and then the amount of vegetative load you'll have on the fence at that time it'll just suck all the your uh, voltage out of out of the fence and you'll have animals getting out because your fences are cold so just keep them on and just keep that flow going that charge running through and uh keeping the brush off and that does a lot of the uh yep. the vegetative load keeps, but keeps that down and, and and something also important to point out for people who aren't familiar with fence is like the fact that you're leaving it on, you're like, oh, you're going to be wasting so much electricity. It's like, it's, it does not actually how it works. It's almost like a battery that's not hooked up to anything when the fence is on. It's like one side of a battery and then the other side of the battery is the ground. And mm -hmm. like the only time when there's flow of electricity really is when they're connected, i.e. when something's shocked, getting, actively getting shocked or mm -hmm. you have a ground, like a really serious ground. It's funneling, it's funneling flow or like amps out of the fence and like into the ground, which is then going to tick over your meter and cost you money as far as electricity. But if you have a cleared fence and it's on, there's almost, there should, in theory, there would be zero, mm -hmm. there'd be zero turnover on your electric meter if, if there's zero load If on the you fence. have just the fence charger, not hooked up to the fence, just yeah. plugged into the wall running, it's going to take, it's going to, yeah. there's not going to be any electricity that it uses yeah exactly so you're not you're not wasting money by having it on or wasting mm. electricity by having it on it's like yeah it's like holding a bucket of water above your head as my brother would describe and like and like that water is up there like ready to be poured but nothing's actually pouring out of the bucket until you tip it and like when you tip it that's like when something's getting shocked or there's a big ground or something and then you're actually flowing electricity out of your bucket and that's what costs you money um but just holding the bucket in the air doesn't cost you any water or any money. Um, mm -hmm. But the the thing to also like didn't make make a distinction is is also the fact that like even if you keep your fences on all the time, you're still periodically going to have to clear brush around them because eventually, the at least in this part of the country, this part of the world, um, I mean, there's just crazy vegetative growth in the in, during the growing season, and so it even though the fence is helping out a lot if it's on all the time, you will get enough load on there where it's going to start pulling it down. And so periodically, every couple of years or whatever, you need to go in there. And if you can keep up on it, like regularly, it's a lot less work. And but if, if you, you have like a lot less fence, it's a exactly. lot less work. If you have a lot less fence, it's a lot less work. But if it's something that you can just sort of periodically try to like cycle through and be like, all right, we're going to clear this fence row like this season or this fence row the next season or whatever, you can sort of cycle around your, your farm like that and keep everything sort of at bay as far as clearing. It's going to help you so much as opposed to building up and building up and building up. And then it's this massive project to have to clear a fence out. Um, so that's something else to think about with perimeter. Um, uh, the, so I guess 
to recap, you got your perimeter that we were just talking about, your interior, don't put it up unless you absolutely are certain that you need it. Um, and then the last piece to the puzzle is what we would call temporary fence. And when we say temporary fence, we're talking about step in posts, poly braid reels, pigtail posts, and like, you know, insulated handles. Yeah. Um, and with, with those, those couple pieces of gear, you can, it is crazy. We can configurations. make any configuration. You, any, anything you, see, you want, we can do it. Anything you need the cattle to do, we can do it with the temporary fence. Um, like I have that much confidence in it. Just, it yeah. just takes our, it's like our brains. Yeah. Like if our brains can do it, we can do it with the fence. It's, it's like, and it's just experience and practice and understanding how to use all of the pieces to make angles and curves and circle around things and do like one-sided use and like weird gate handles, gate handles. Little catch pens and yep. yeah making lanes to catch pens yeah it's 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 a pretty once you're if your cattle are broke to it and and you have the the equipment for it like it is an incredibly powerful tool it's mm -hmm. it's crazy it just gives you so much confidence we built a lane the other day yeah um, we, we we're trying to skip them up to a so on the on the Judy farm, there's a mile long stretch that's pretty narrow. So what we're trying to do is skip them up through that to the northernest part of the farm, graze that off, and then graze our way back until spring. And so we had to take the you know had to make a long cattle drive. We stopped at the at the beginning of the Judy farm. Then we made a cattle drive to the middle, and then yes or this morning we made a cattle drive to the the top part. Yep. And so. Uh, in order to make that lane, we were sitting there thinking, oh, oh how are we going to do this? We got to do double lane all the way to this paddock, and that's going to eat up a lot of posts and reels. And then we're like, oh, there's a there's a perimeter fence right there. Why don't we just, well, first we were like, we can just scoot up, like, yeah. go for it, you know, go about 500 yards, yards or whatever. whatever, and then scoot over to the fence and then take that, use the fence as one side of the lane and just do one side temporary all the way to the paddock. And we're like, oh. we're sitting there thinking, we're like, why don't we just do it all the way from this paddock? Because yeah. the fence comes all the way to here. Yeah. So we're like, well, that's a lot easier. And so we just had to make one single side of the lane. That all then the way to the turned paddock. into the that then turned in turned into the the paddock, the paddock wall itself yeah. and like skirted around a pond and then hooked onto a fence. It, it was, was the pretty, longest stretch of fence crazy. I think we've ever made. If, if we had stretch. a map, it would be cool to show. Yeah, like, it was like it was like I don't know. It was probably. Two thirds of a not two we thirds started, of a mile. Yeah, we started on we one had side to two thirds of a mile long fence. I'm gonna draw it because it's kind of cool. But anyway, it was just very cool to be able to see. It's something that a, like a it's a piece of fence that we never put up like traditionally, and so just like understanding like oh like we have the we have the capability of doing this. Like there's no there's no permanent paddocks in the way of us doing this or anything. It's just that flexibility of having it all open allows you to do things like this where you can make long lanes where like normally there would be paddocks or normally you would graze and um it just makes it a lot easier uh and it doesn't take that long to set it up and put it back and and set it up and take it down um and that has to do with the the, the setup of the four-wheeler and the way that we the way that we like run fence um which we can get into if people are interested but um it's a little bit tricky to describe um without actually seeing the four-wheeler in person but what do you got all right so what we got is uh oh i'm not gonna be able to see it very That's well fine. let's see so this is the north place i'll have to look at it through the shadow so the cattle were right in here i don't know if it's yeah right there right in here and what we did to make the lane is we hooked on cold here and ran it to this wire and then followed this wire all the way up. That's like a, at least a half mile, would yeah, you say? Yeah, probably a half mile. Close to a half mile. And then we curved it back, skirted around this pond, gave them a drinking spot, and then hooked it onto the fence. So then this was their paddock. And when we moved them in there that this morning, we just put a wire right here, keeping them in this paddock. So it was, it was kind of cool Yeah. to see uh, what we got. Oh, my phone's kind of acting up. Yeah, that's fine. Um, um, yeah, but and then as far as as far as materials are concerned, the stuff that we recommend, which we we've, we've expressed multiple times on here, and we'll keep reiterating it because it's definitely it's it's proven at this point. Um, is your your step ins O'Brien step ins are the best step ins made. Um, we prefer 
like blue is a really good color because white doesn't show up very well in the winter time. Um, yellow, yellow is a good color. One of the better ones. Um, we don't have we don't have a lot of yellow ones, but 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 yellow would yellow would be a great color because it would show up in the winter and and in the summer. The blue sometimes gets hidden by the grass a little bit, but it's not too bad. Um, mm -hmm. And then you've got your Terragate reels, which are a three to one I weird if reel. Red would be a good color, probably. Of course, red. If, if you're red, 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 if you're green, red, green colorblind, then red it's, and green then it's, then it's a problem. <laughs> Greg wouldn't be. <laughs> Greg wouldn't be able to see his posts. He's kind. Of, he's like kind of. He's like kind of colorblind a little bit. Um, anyway, yeah, he'll always say the red gate, and it's a green gate. It's a green, green, green gate. gate yeah. It's a red gate. Yeah. Um, Go up to the green gate. Uh, yeah, and so then Terragate reels. It's a three to one geared reel. Um, they the the gears are really well made, so they don't fall apart. Um, that's the biggest thing that happens with a lot of geared reels is the is just just by using them and then being outside, like that gear box on the inside would just fall apart, and then the reels trashed at that point. Like you can't even use it. Um, we I mean people will use like the stuff as simple as like extension cord reels, you know, like you can just buy them at like a Home hardware Depot, store, yeah. Home Depot or whatever, but you just hand and you hand wind it. Um, those one, one gear ratio, those that's a one to one gear ratio. And those work if you're, if you're only setting up short stretches of fence, like a couple hundred feet, but if you're setting up a half a mile of fence, like we just did with, with that reel, oh, it would be an I absolute nightmare. Imagine. I don't think you could do it. It would take you so long that it just wouldn't even be practical. Oh. Um, because these these geared reels can hold well the one that we have holds three thirteen hundred and twenty feet per mm -hmm. reel you can get double sized reels that hold even more be heavy um because they're, they're just wider uh that would be like for some seriously big herds and and, and big and areas big areas because what we'll do is is we'll tie one reel onto another reel to make so like we'll we'll run one out completely and then when that reel ends we'll take that piece of poly braid and tie it to another piece of poly braid and then run that reel and keep going. So we can just keep doing that as long as we need. And like, you know, three, four reels in the extreme case, but sometimes you just tie two of them together and you're good to go. So And then, you're, and then for those that like kind of understand what's going on, you're not gonna be able to make it tight from the one end. Mm -mm. So what we do is on the way back to where we were going, we just every 200 yards we'd stop or whenever it was like saggy. It's loose. We'll just go and just twist one of the temporary posts and then stick it back in the ground. And, and so it that tightens, tightens the it back up. Yep. Um, and then PowerFlex Poly Braid. The, I can tell you exactly what the, what the um, specs are on that one. It's, it's the, let's see, temporary fence. It's the Super 9 Mixed Tin Copper Stainless Steel Poly Braid. There's like, it's like, what it's a mixed metal... Um, that stuff is in, then they, they make two different widths. There's like a thin width and, and like a slightly thicker width. It's the thin, it's the thin one. Um, because the thick, the thick stuff sort of knots itself up a lot. Um, yeah, but yeah. And then the pigtail posts, those are pretty standard. It's just, you know, a pigtail post. You just don't want the really tall I think ones. Power flex makes the best yep. pigtail just Power flex. it's shorter. So it's got less of a cantilever action going on. It doesn't pull itself out of the ground too much. And we only use those for corners or ending temporary posts. We don't use them as like line posts, which a lot of people do because they're heavy and they don't stack. So when you're trying to pick them up, you can only carry it like a small handful of them at a time. Whereas like I, I can probably carry like 50 to 70 um, like timeless or O'Brien, sorry, not timeless O'Brien step-ins just cause yeah. they're light and they stack really well on top of each other. Um, they make, they make your life a lot easier. Um, and then your, your, we just use cold handles because if we need a hot handle, so like, sorry, a non-conductive handle to like, it's just a little plastic, little plastic handle with a hole on one end and a hook on the other. And it's made of plastic, plastic. They come handle. with the tear gate reels. Yeah. And it's not, it's not conductive, but some people will use like, like those handles that have switches in them where you can make it cold or make it hot. Um, well, there's a, there's a handle. I don't know who came out with it. It's white and it's got, so on the one side where you tie on, you can either tie it on cold, tie it on hot. Yeah. You can either hook it on hot or hook it on cold all in the same handle. Like just like the way it's designed. <laughs> but <laughs> our I, luck, we'd forget, we'd forget. Which, whether we made it cold there, hot there, or 
tied it on hot or tied it on in cold and we'd go to put it on and we'd shock ourselves like so many times the, uh, the other thing too is like if we ever need to make a handle hot we just give ourselves a couple extra inches of slack and we'll just wrap the the poly braid with the with the, the non-conductive handle we'll just use that as a as an actual handle and just wrap that poly braid around the hot wire and then it electrifies the fence and so then we need to take it off you just unwrap it so it just saves a lot of hassle of like remembering if you've got it hooked onto what and if you put a conductive handle on one end or a non-conductive one on the other. And so it just makes it simple. Reels are conductive, handles are not, and for the most part. And then you can you can switch them if you really need to. But yeah, that's it. That's it in a nutshell. I think that sort of covers a lot of the basics. I know we probably confused a lot of people and I know we probably helped a lot of people. Um, so we'll just get into the questions and comments and I'm sure there's going to be stuff about fencing and whatever else but just start throwing stuff out there and we'll answer everybody uh girls girl walks with goats says yes i have several woven wire paddocks that i started with now i just want to take down half of them and divide it all with temporary wire yeah like like yeah that's that's what we were talking about i mean and and that happened with greg too he used to do all permanent paddocks mm -hmm. and then he i think he had an intern one time that was like why don't you just do it all temporary? Why do you need all these paddocks? And he was like, yeah, I don't really know why I need all these paddocks. And so then they yeah. ripped them all out. Yeah. Um, but it's just something that you learn from, from doing, you know, yeah. but we have the advantage of working with Greg and he's made the mistake. And so we, we get, get to learn, learn from it. Yeah. yeah. Killing farm says just curious. We have a stay fix and close to the charger. The fault finder shows amp loss of 18 or so but never find a fault and the fence is hot all the way to the furthest point on the farm 18 is not that much no but we've we've had that happen yeah we were, what were we, the, what were the mystery with? short we were we were getting like it was registering a load like into the ground rod which is which is very bizarre but it, i feel like it was even like yeah it was like close to the charger and yeah. it was like 100 amps or something yeah and it like was i think we like unhooked the power even so yeah. it wasn't even going through or like we unhooked the ground so it wasn't even like yeah. it wasn't something the fence was there was some weird thing going on yeah so. they can get confusing the if, like chargers yeah. and chargers and ground rods and whatever can get confusing if it's if it's keeping your fence hot i would say it's and, it's and by hot if you have over basically like over four thousand to five thousand volts if you have over five thousand volts you're going to be okay like we're keeping animals in mm -hmm. um obviously you want the hotter the better but if you're getting down below four like consistently and it's not just because oh it's been wet and we have a lot of like wet vegetation that's on the fence so it's dragging a bunch of stuff down if it's just like consistently in the twos threes yeah. like low low fours sort of like that area yeah you, then you need to start looking for for shorts and usually when that's the case your 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 tester will tell you that you have amp load of like 30 plus amps um and that's when yeah. an amp is amps is that flow so that's the signal that something is is taking your fence down and usually if you have crazy high amp loads like in the 80s 60s 70s whatever like you got something metal on the fence or like a ground wire wrapped around a hot wire or something like that um because vegetative load it's like it doesn't it doesn't have that serious of a ground um, it doesn't well it, it can i guess if it's over time but it's but like if if your fence is normal like for the most part and then you come to it one time and it's like crazy high amps yeah, for like no reason it's not vegetation it's something something maybe else. a tree fell and it's got all four wires bit stuck into the ground or something yeah like, um those little fence testers that tell you what your amp load is and 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 what your voltages are so helpful like incredibly helpful of like walking fences back to the source of a problem um they're they're 100 percent worth worth the money so yeah anyone ever use a bat latch from turkey hollow farm we we haven't used the the brand the brand name bat latch um there's there's something something else that we were working with it's like a developing still, project. We yeah. can't really talk a lot about it, but like, um, w w the short answer is no. We, we don't use them typically here. Um, here, and that's just because we we exist, and so there's always somebody <laughs> there's always somebody to move cattle. But the but the the advantage of it too, though, like of bat latches, and for people who aren't familiar, it's an automatic gate opener that's on a timer, 
Um, and there's a bunch of different configurations with them. Yeah. Um, like you got some that will like lift right. a wire completely up in the air and let the cattle walk underneath it. You have some that'll like open, open gates. Gate. Yeah. Um, some that'll drop a wire to the ground. Um, so, but the advantage is like you could set up, if it's just you, you could set up paddock moves and get it all timed out so you don't have to go out to the cattle. They're just moving themselves and they yeah. get used to that sound of the bat latch give going off and so then they that they associate that with food. Yep. They they learn quick. Yep. Um and the 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 other thing too, like not only just being able to plan out animal moves in advance, is like you can get some serious um like some seriously like frequent and high some frequent moves and therefore like high stocking rates in your paddocks because you could set up, you could take a paddock that you normally give them for one day and you could divide it into fourths and put a bat latch on each division. And then every like hour or two, you could have the bat latch open. And so they're grazing and then they get a fresh strip and they're grazing and they get a fresh strip. And so like they're, they're constantly being moved under fresh ground and constantly eating and so it's really good for like that's really good for finishing animals yeah um super good it's like it increases their plane of nutrition so they they end up putting out a lot of weight doing that which is a good thing when was it one time greg uh he went out to see if he could if he could make his cattle too full or something and yeah every hour or every time he saw a cow so he'd move into a paddock and then he just stayed there with the cattle all day and every time he saw Whenever the first cow laid down, he went and rolled up the wire again and gave him a new strip. And so every time when they're just getting full, he'd give him another strip and they'd go and graze. And he did that all day long. I'm pretty sure. He wasn't he wasn't necessarily sure if it was a good thing or not, <laughs> but but he's like he just kept eating all day. Cause usually what a cow will do is eat and then when they fill up, they go lay down and they ruminate. And then once they've sort of started to process all that grass that they consume, because they just shovel it in. Yeah, they like just it's not eat. like they're not the way that they digest, they're not actually like chewing it really they're just shoveling it in so they can start to they can start to get it broken down into like one area and then gets like you know regurgitated back up and then the microbes break it down again and then once it starts to like cycle through then they stand back up again and go and eat and so he he just he just kept them constantly eating all day instead of instead of like <laughs> so sitting down and he's ruminating. Like, i guess they probably ruminated all night long but i don't really know <laughs> yeah so i don't know but like it, like it, for finishing animals, if you can, if you you have a capability of doing that, you're gonna put so much so much fat on the animals that way, it, like good fat. There's um, a there's a guy or there, Ian Mitchell Ennis, Greg's African friend, mentor or whatever. He had a video that he showed Greg one time of yeah. this these this guy. What he did is he had you know he had this big paddock and then he had a cross wire up in front of these cattle. And the, the posts, they were on like little sleds or whatever, runners. And the cattle had learned to kind of nudge those those sled those sleds forward. And so they'd be grazing and then they were all lined up in this long line, like what, 400 head or something. Maybe it, it might have been in the yeah, thousands or I something. I don't know. And they would just push that wire a little bit at a time. And you could watch it. They'd just be slowly moving across the paddock all at the same, all like kind of like a feed bunk and they all just start walking and grazing as they go like you talk about serious gains i mean they're they're just eating as fast as they can because their buddy right next to them is trying to get that bite and yeah there's so many things about that that i have questions about because it's like how the heck do they keep it in a straight line like yeah. how did how did how did not like one part of the line go forward than the other and like what stopped them from just constantly pushing it as opposed to like eating and nudging it but anyway yeah. it's, it's a cool concept think, like in theory yeah. I think it'd be super cool to see. Yeah. <laughs> um, George Heller, have you ever, have you tried pasture management step-ins? I don't think so. Um, I can tell you that. I tried Gallagher's. They're junk. Yeah. I can tell you that if there's a better post out there, Greg, Greg, would, Greg have. would have already heard about it. So it's like O'Brien step-ins will last you like over a decade yeah like they, they 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 last you so long if you take care of them and so it's not like you're buying a five dollar post and then it's like breaking down in a couple of years like they're just gonna last and last and last they're gonna outlast all yeah. of their competitors so they're actually cheaper in the long run than than buying a cheaper post um like it's one of those things we're so convinced about it if you if you've got a well, granted it's like if you have a system that you're that's very similar to greg's because there's other ways that you can herd 
animals and keep them controlled. But if this is the way that you're going to be controlling your animals, like it is one of the things that you should spend money on. Like if you're, if you're like concerned about like pinching pennies in certain areas, like, so you can, you can skate by, Don't like skimp on temporary if you fence. have the money to do it, do not skimp on temporary fence. Um, it is it, like it, we use it, it's used constantly. And so the thing that you use constantly is not something that you want to be buying cheap material for. Um, find something else that you don't use a lot to, to go cheap until you can afford it. But like, I would highly, highly, highly recommend saving your money and spending it on the best quality temporary equipment that you can. So, yep. all right. Alder pine homestead. So I have eight acres of pasture. I'd like to put high tensile around the whole perimeter and just use step in posts and a couple of reels, whatever to move the cattle. And I could just jump off the perimeter questions it's a big square pasture yeah, yeah i think that's for sure eight that's, acres for sure that's definitely what you need to do as far as get the get the perimeter fence and then just use temporary yeah um, you're gonna find out real quick whether you know maybe you want to split maybe you would want to put a single temporary line down the middle or maybe you want to put it you know you're gonna find that out using the temporary fence what works best for that piece yep and like if where your water where you want your water to be positioned to then graze that paddock the best. So, but yeah, keep do it in temporary. Yep, yeah, especially with eight acres. Yeah. Yeah. When you start getting to like, when you understand the length of a reel that you're using, so like if you have a 1,320 foot reel, if you're constantly gonna have to be tying two reels together to make a paddock division, you should highly consider putting a, a, a divider in because it's just gonna save you a lot of time and materials to do it that way. But in the um, beginning, yeah. I would even say just sock it up and use and use the double reel and then figure out like where that divider needs to go um because if you put it in and then you have to take it back out you, it's so much work yep yep uh there's some rollers there's some rollers for strip grazing i think the spider wheels yep I've seen the those. ends get pulled forward and the middle just rolls forward Looks cool. Don't know how well it would work in real life. The ends. I've seen. I've seen finishing operations use it. Like I think. Yeah. I think it's. I've it's, seen it. I've seen it in use. It looks. Yeah. There was a. There was a place. Wasn't it in New York or something? They had like this big circle, and they just. Used yeah, I've them seen it in, to rotate I've seen around. It in, the circle. Yeah, on the East Coast, there's a there's a, a finishing. There's like there's like an organization that finishes cattle for like producers, where like you you basically like raise your animal on grass or whatever. And then when it gets, you know, whatever, to the age of window that they want it at, then you, you sell it to them and then they finish it and market yeah. it essentially. So it's kind of like a different version of like a sale barn, yeah. you know, but like the way that they finished their animals was using a lot of those wheels. Um, yeah. I think it's cool. I yeah. think there's very specific applications for yeah. it. Especially if you're and it sort of goes back to the, the fact that we don't, we're not really a grass fed beef operation we're a grass-fed seed stock operation if you want to call it that yeah um and so like finishing grass genetics yeah grass genetic operation so getting animals finished at a highly efficient rate is not something that's a priority for us it's more main, making sure that our animals are in peak condition all the time so that so that they like like we're, we're able to assess proper genetics and, and understand you know, like which animals are going to perform the best and like try to like hone in on that type of a deal. But if you know, like, I could see a situation where if you're somebody who's cranking out whatever, like dozens of steers, like over the course of the year, you know what I mean? Like the growing season, trying to, trying to finish them out for, for customers or whatever, like having, having like some areas for certain times of year that you're using those wheels to finish them in. That yeah. would be that'd be an, a really interesting application. We just don't have a lot of experience with it because it's not a priority. Mm -hmm. And there's too many hills here. <laughs> too many hills. Well, I mean, there's certain areas we could do it. Yeah, they are the yellow ones. George said we the two yeah. that we had probably are the ones he's talking about. Oh, they, they. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. They're the kind of posts. brittle. The they're the, more brittle than the the O'Briens. So far, they've held up though. Yeah, I did have one clip snap off this when it got really cold. They're they're pretty good. I mean, like they're not they're way better than than some yeah. some options. Like they're very similar in dimensions to an O'Brien, but the plastic it's like a little thinner is 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 not as flexible 
Mm-hmm. It's and like, like more the clips, rigid. The clips are a little thinner. That, and yeah. that's the biggest difference is the clips mm-hmm. because they're they're also it's hard to describe, but they're like they're bigger. Like the space of the clip is larger than mm-hmm. the O'Brien is. Like it sticks out more, um, which makes it. I would, which makes it. I mean, they haven't really broken that much to be honest. But like, I would think over time, like if you had a lot of those, like the clips would end up snapping because they're just hanging out a it's lot more. More of a, they're more out there to catch. The more catch on and catch on each other. Yeah. Um. But so far they've they've worked okay. I just can't. I wouldn't put my faith in anything other than an O'Brien step in. When you just they just feel like they're gonna last. Like when you pick up something that's made really well and you can just tell. Yeah. Like when you oh, pick new O'Brien posts are like when you, so nice. when you pick the two like the two posts up together they look really similar but when you pick the two of them up you can like you can easily tell the difference. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, the other little tip we do with O'Briens is we'll take every single post that we get and we'll grind, uh, like just a pencil point onto the end of every single post, um, and that makes a massive difference when there's really dry ground or really frozen ground. And you can still step a post in. Like when it was negative five or negative ten out, and the ground here was frozen completely solid for two and a half weeks, we we made sure first of all we set up most of our paddocks before. But there was a couple fences that we set up in the middle of that, mm-hmm. and we were able to get. I mean, it's, you can't get the plastic foot into the into the ground, but that metal you spike find a grass clump, and then you can stick that spike right in the middle of that, and that's how you can get them. And and no just that is. little bit of extra sharpness on the end of the post, because they come blunt, because they can't ship them sharp. Um, mm-hmm. but they they come blunt, and they'll work blunt. But like if you not in the freezing cold. Yeah, but if exactly if you just spend the time to do it, it doesn't take that long. It takes like a minute or two per post. Um, you know. You just grind it out, no yeah. pun intended. <laughs> about, an, about an hour, you can knock out fifty of them. Yeah. Or whatever. It's sort of like a zen, sort of a zen. It's kind of activity. It's kind of uh, soothing. You get you, you get, get really you get really good at like the technique, like yeah. of t- trying to get that that thing shaved down as fast as possible and like nice and uniform. Yeah. It's kind of it's kind of fun. Yeah. But is. I wouldn't want to do it every day. But I mean, like, you it's really like, not that bad. You feel like I feel like when I'm doing it, I'm like. You know, like the knife smiths of like, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. like making like handmade knives. It's yeah. Like, oh, I'm making a knife. Yeah. It's like, I'm going to use post. this baby. Going to make it. You don't want to get too carried away and make a needle point sharp. Oh, they I've hurt. poked a hole in myself multiple times yeah. with those things. It just needs a little punch hole. And it's like, because most of those are Greg and Greg getting too carried away and putting a real, real needle point just sharp. Just a little on bit. Because there's a fine line between perfect and. and too much and too much. And it's like easy to go too much. You you don't want you don't want a hypodermic needle sharp. You want it like a pencil, mm-hmm. you know, like just a a run of the mill mm-hmm. pencil. That's how sharp you want it to be. But yep. Anyway. Anyways, um, uh, is there any big differences in high density grazing sheep rather than cows? Uh, the bit I've tried so far leads to mostly trampling and not any more utilization, eating of forage wise. Yeah, I mean. The 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 sheep are definitely going to walk a lot more than the cattle. Yep. They just they just walk. And so then they foul a lot more foul as in like get their manure or their scent on a lot more uh, a lot more grass or a lot more area than the cattle. The yep. cattle they're heavier and so they're gonna have more of a impact on the land just because of their, their size. Um so that's kind of the two differences. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um they graze pretty similar. Yep. And I don't know. Yeah. Anything else? I think like we so like there's like like the high density grazing thing is is kind of it's kind of interesting because it's not like like there's a level to which it's not productive. As in like if you if you if you like okay it's a it's it's a nuanced it's a nuanced issue but like if if you're constantly at a stocking rate where you're just hammering the forage like you're just taking it down every paddock just down like like you're just taking a lawnmower across it and you're like man like this is so cool um you know uniformly grazing like all the weeds and and everything like that and and you're gonna get some like like awesome like regrowth from that if you have the proper growing conditions like really great we call it like landscaping capability but as far as like 
if you're con if you're paying attention at all to animal performance in that kind of a scenario, you can't really do that in perpetuity and expect your animals to do well. And because they're they're eating a lot that's not something they normally would eat because you're forcing them to do it based on that high density. And so we we like we're high density like high density and compared to any sort of conventional numbers as far as stocking rate, but there's this fine balance between like managing height of your grass and making sure you're leaving a lot of residual in the growing season, which is what we like to do, and then and taking it down too short. And I think we've talked about this too. There's 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 this sort of rhythm that you can do and incorporate both, but you don't want to be constantly hammering stuff at super high densities all the time because your animals are going to suffer. And also you you're sort of like gambling a little bit with the fact that if you don't get any moisture, you just shot yourself in the foot because that, it, four, that paddock's not going to come back. It's not going to come back. Um, versus the other one that has more of a leaf area, there's more of a carbohydrate store for that plant to just jump back from getting clipped um, or grazed off, I should say. Uh, I mean... There yeah. are instances where, like with the cockleburs, I don't know if you followed that, if any of you guys saw that on the YouTube, on Greg's YouTube, but where yeah. we... It was like a million pounds to the acre or something density, density, which is like, when you get up to those numbers, that's like short duration moves. Like we were there for half half an hour or max. Yeah, we like half I think an hour, yeah, I think it was like thirty. Maybe. I think it was like thirty thirty minute moves. Thirty yeah. minute moves, and then we we're moving to the next. So you can get that density, but you gotta. It's like a balance between density and time. Like there's a very, it's it's like a dance. Yeah. <laughs> You yeah, dance to dance. Yeah, because you're you're trying to manage you're trying to manage animal performance and 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 well being, as well as land, but it's not that simple because when, yeah, there's a lot of benefit to leaving residual. When you and, hear people yeah. saying, "Oh yeah, I had my cows stocked at five hundred thousand pound density for all all day long," it's like that's when you hear those numbers, you can tell and you know that that guy is doing it. You know, he's yeah. a, he's kind of, he's pushing his animals too hard. Yeah. I think it's somewhere around like it's like, like 60 yeah. 60,000 pounds per acre. Cuz I think like, we're like 40,000 usually. Like yeah, somewhere 40, in that 000. neighborhood we're usually at 40,000 pounds to, to but the that's, acre. But that's that's I think we're usually stocked a little heavier because we're half day moves. Yep. So for half a day 260 animal units is on. Yeah. 6 acres or whatever whatever yeah. it is that we, the paddock is on. So yep. like that density but they're only there for half a day, and yeah. then we're moving them. Whereas if we were to leave them there for the full day, we'd have, we'd to, have give to give them a bigger, bigger area. area. So, um, but yeah, it's 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 fun to sort of play around with because it is cool if you can, like the land, responds to having instances of like heavy grazing versus that normal height controlled like third residual type stuff that we usually do. So if you can sort of plan in, watch your weather patterns like and and look at like what kind of areas on your farm need a little bit more of that like injection of animals animal density and like consumption um in a, in a certain spot plan it out and be like all right we're gonna go hard for like these couple of moves and then after that like give your animals a break and give them as much as they need to eat let them recover get that that big residual for you know the, the paddocks after that and then maybe plan out scope out another area a couple of weeks later and be like all right we're gonna hit that if we got the proper conditions for it you know yeah. and oh and like we've seen some cool results with paddocks that we've just absolutely steamrolled in comparison to what we normally do um, if you think about like like the american bison like before european settlers or whatever these two million three million it her head herds you know traveling across the landscape what that like those they were stocked heavy but they were only there for a sh very very short they were on the move you know they were constantly moving um and so whatever like that impact that that land had it was absolutely just hammered and then it was gone and the 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 animals were still moving so they were able to keep that nutrition flowing through them they were never that they were never stocked that heavy and stationary if that makes sense like they always had fresh piece to move to um, and that's kind of what you're, you're trying to replicate is you, you're trying to get that density, but you're also trying to keep them, keep them, um, full or yeah. keep them eating. Um, yeah. Like keep, keep their diet and their microbes at, at a good spot because mm -hmm. once they start eating a lot of woody lignified stuff, a lot of like noxious weeds, like low nutrition quality stuff, then their gut biome changes and 
the nutrition that they're getting changes and and then they can start to drop condition when you don't want them to. Mm-hmm. Uh, we got a couple more. Uh, come on. The O'Briens do seem better than the pasture management when you hold them. That's what George said. Yeah. Yeah. You can just tell. I yeah. Mean, you can tell good quality from yeah. average. Uh, what are you using to grind the points? We just use a bench grinder. Yep. We'll use the side. So Greg's got a, one of his one of his side is used for like normal projects, and one side is used for just specific posts because you'll kind of you'll kind of uh, put a lot of wear on the the bench grinder. But we'll just come in from the side of it. You know the the side that's spinning in, and we'll come in at an angle. Like if this is the grinder, and then we'll just grind, and then rotate the post as we're doing it, spinning in a circle, and make a pencil point. Yep. It's pretty intuitive. Pretty simple. Yeah. One more question, Alder Pine Homestead. Uh, if you don't mind, we have a lot of Idaho fescue here. Is it similar to Kentucky Thirty One or different in some way? It's really thick as well. Idaho fescue. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, like, I I don't I, have I don't I have don't the internet, enough. so I, I got a computer here, but I don't have internet, so I can't look it up. Yeah, I could look up. I could look up. I could figure out if it's in the same. If it's in the same genus or, or something like that. But um, so the short answer is we're not we – our, our, our experience is just with the stuff that we've got here. So um, I'm assuming if it's – if the common name's Idaho fescue, huh. then it's going to be – it's going to be in the fescue family. Yeah. But – Species grass known by the common names Idaho fescue. Blue bunch grass. It's native to north – to western the, North America – where it is widespread and common. Blue bunch grass. Can you find a mini? Cause I'm sure you're so, planes. just like just by that, I don't. I think it's probably it might be it might be kind of different. It looks pretty similar. It's 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 got a good sod. It looks like. See. Yeah. It, I don't know about the nutrition. The of nutrition. It. it looks pretty. I mean. Yeah. I don't know enough but about if it's, it to but, say. Yeah, anything. I don't know enough to say to say anything about it either. There's Sorry. A, there's a. Yeah, but see how it's growing in like bunches. Like yeah. it's not actually like forming like a sod. I mean, like it's, it's a, a sod, sod but, but it's, it's not. not thick, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not. It's not like a carpet, you know. Yeah. I don't know. Which I don't know. We're just looking at. I mean, it's not really gonna be helpful because we're just looking at pictures yeah. on Wikipedia. Like anybody can. Anybody can do that. But yeah, no, we don't have any experience with it, unfortunately. Yeah. All right. I don't have any more questions, right. so I think that'll that'll about wrap it up. That was, was a, a good one. that was a good good discussion per usual. Um, yeah, thanks for everybody who tuned in. The last week's episodes, last week's clips, sorry, from the episode about uh, water infrastructure. Um, those are going to be uploaded tomorrow. Um, in the I'm almost done with half of them as far as getting them all fixed and finished on YouTube. So those will be up. So stay tuned. I'll make a post about that. Um. Yeah, I think that's about it. Kind of um, wraps it up. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thanks everybody for tuning in. We're, for participating, um, we love yeah, doing always, this. It's good for us. It gives us a yeah a jolt of yeah enthusiasm going into the week. It gets the wheels turning for sure. Yep. Um, we hope hope it does the same to you. Yeah. Um, exactly. So anyway, look forward to seeing you guys again here next week around seven thirty. Look for the announcement on Sunday. Um, somebody message me if I forget. I think that's about it. See everybody on Sunday.